Welcome back to Team O'Neill. I'm Chris. I'm Ryan from Thompson Racing Fabrication. And we're here to today to discuss roll cage safety and design. So please join us for our new video series. So in this video, guys, we're gonna talk about design theory, design theory of roll cages specifically. So Ryan, when you think about designing a roll cage, what are the thoughts that are going through your mind? The first most critical thing is compliance to a sanctioning body. Wherever it's gonna race, we need to fit the rules. Right. And where do you find that? Where's, where's the resources that you have? There's rule books. Uh, we keep a printed copy in our shop for quick reference, but uh, between ARA, SCCA, NASA, everyone's got the uh, rule book ready and available. Are they different? Are they Absolutely. Different? Okay. What is your, I guess, what's the highest level or the safest standard in your mind? The FIA standard is probably the highest standard, and we feel like it trumps most all other sanctioning bodies and generally accepted everywhere. So if you build an FIA cage, pretty much you, you're pretty clear in most other racing standards. That tends to be the case, yes. Okay. And if we're talking rally specific design, uh, what do you see the most common design built in the U.S.? We all have to comply to Article 253 in the FIA regulations, so that's, that's where everyone starts. Okay, so Article 253, we'll put that resource for you guys in the comment section, just so if you need to directly access that. So when, when you have an actual design, you've got a minimum safety standard that's set by a sanctioning body, then what do you think of beyond that? Then obviously the customer input comes into play, whatever their own personal level of safety is, their prior experiences, things they're cautious of. Really, if we've done our job well, everything is compliant, safe, strong, but the customer needs to be very comfortable and should never think about the work we've done because they're very sure of what we've done. Right, and that's history usually, right? And what do you see in design? You know, you also provide log books for other people for building their own home cage. Like, what are the, the decisions you can make in design that maybe feel like something you might not do? There's a lot that goes into design theory. Uh, the structure, how you assemble tubes, load paths, you're creating nodes, just finer details that maybe not every builder has a grasp of. All right, Ryan, so when you've got the minimum expectation for the design of a roll cage from a sanctioning body, then what do you do when you actually design the cage? What are the thoughts and things that when you actually build a roll cage here? The highest level primary considerations is our door design, construction of nodes, where we're placing load paths through the base plates, or even the alloys and materials we're using to build the cage. So when we think of like a roll cage, what we're doing is we're trying to shift weight. Is that kind of like a high level theory of what a roll cage design is? Absolutely, about transferring energy to a safe path away from the occupants. So when we think of a high level design, we've got, we call A pillar, B pillar, and like a C pillar Correct. kind of structure. And in that, we're trying to shift weight around of, of a potential future impact. Or energy, yeah. Exactly. We're, we're transferring that weight through one tube into another and ultimately you want all the energy to end up in the chassis of the car, not into the occupant or into space. And so that's what we're doing is trying to create a safety bubble as much as we can in, with the occupants of the vehicle yeah. and let everything else around it absorb any potential future damage. Absolutely. Um, something I've never heard before we started talking was a node. Can you define a node and maybe show me what the node is? Well, the node is right here. You have all of the pieces coming together at one point. It allows you to focus energy. It doesn't create shear points, which is very dangerous and a common point of failure. It's, it's directing all of the energy into one common place and allowing all of these tubes to work together and carry strength from the total structure instead of just one piece acting on its own. So in a poor design, a node could be a massive weak point. Yes. In a good design, it's actually the strongest point. That's correct. Is that kind of a yes. good, simple way to think of it? So if you're not very experienced in putting metal together, welding, and creating this design, this is where a rookie or a home-built roll cage could have weakness or something that you would be concerned with if you're looking at it from a tech perspective. Absolutely. Uh, Nodes are technically more challenging to create. There's more notching, more welding, more angles. A combination where there's not a node is far easier to fabricate, and usually we see it in 
lesser shops or most often a DIY builder. Okay. So that's an interesting point and that's something I, being around Rally for as long as I have been, I didn't realize the, even the importance of that in my own thoughts. So if you, as somebody who's never really seen a roll cage before, you could start to go around to uh, uh, Park Exposé and look at people's roll cage designs and start to see a range of nodes, right? And so you would say this is probably a higher end design you know, not to be selfish, this is your built roll cage. So <laughs> a little bit of an example of what your, your shop's capable of doing. Um, but there's nodes all over this roll cage. So that's not the only node. You have nodes at kind of every intersecting point. Is that what a node is? Purposefully, and uh, maybe the phrase I created myself, we try not to have any dead end tubing. Dead ends where you have a, a, an energy path that ends in, in air. Or if you have an intersecting tube that doesn't have support on the back side. That, that creates a point where the energy, can, it ends. It usually will end up with a failure of the tubing, where if everything's supported going, ultimately ending up in the chassis, it's a much stronger total structure. So maybe we have an example of, of, of that exactly. So let's move to that real quick. So this is a good example of bad design. Okay. You have a load path coming down here and ending in space instead of landing at the chassis. It's going to fail adjacent to this weld I and see. actually not compliant and would probably not pass tech at many sanctioning bodies. So because those are fully separated, that is not a node, right? A Correct. node has to have everything come together. And then because that bar is not going into the actual car itself, the chassis, if there was a roll, this car rolled or had a, a significant top end impact, you would expect that bar to just blow right through yes. that piece of metal. Yep. Our, lo our load path ends in space okay. instead of ending in the chassis. Right. Okay, and so that would not absorb the, the weight of, of whatever in that crash or incident a, just on that one tube. It's a much weaker structure. Much weaker structure. Awesome. Well, yeah, let's go back to the other one and talk a little bit more about the design. Great. Well, I think that was helpful to see a different example. I think one thing, Ryan, that I'm curious about is the design of the, the actual door bars and getting in and out of the roll cage here. Sure. And there's a ton of different ways to to do door design and even all of them can be very successful and safe. It comes down to occupants, personal preference, their experiences and what they feel comfortable in. So what did you do with this? Like what, how did you design this specific cage and what could somebody do a little differently if you're doing this at home or, or what are the, some of the decisions you can make? This, this is compliant because we need to have a minimum one bar of inch and three quarter tubing. We have two in this case. So we, we did a little bit of an upgrade there, but this customer really wants the very most ingress and egress. They're very concerned about how quickly they can get in and out of the car, especially in case of an emergency. So they're sacrificing a little bit of total strength from side impact, but they're gaining egress potential, which is their biggest concern. Cause I've seen roll bars where there's an X here, right? Sure. With a gusset in the middle, um, which we can show an example of that, but it's something that would that necessarily be a potentially a safer for a side impact, but maybe a little harder to get in and out? Yeah, it makes a total stronger structure, but it does confine smaller the ingress and egress path. Okay, so some decisions that can be made on your personal preference on, yes. on the design of that specifically. So for the actual part of the design too, Ryan, is the base plate, and that's the node coming down into the actual frame of the vehicle, right? Absolutely. Um, there's a couple key factors to consider with base plates and location of them and construction of a base plate. Where you locate it has a lot to do with chassis rigidity, how strong the total product is, and also can contribute significantly to performance when you're tying in suspension components and other aspects of the car which need okay. or benefit from rigidity. Right. So part of the roll cage design can actually be performance in this sense as well. Absolutely. Our primary consideration is safety, of course, but then sure. you build in a significant amount of rigidity, which will give you a competitive advantage. So in this car, in the occupant area, we have the base plate in the A pillar. There's a base plate in the B pillar, and then you've got another one in the C pillar. Is yes. that kind of uh, an accurate description? Right. This is a good example of, we chose this location because it's the top of the rear strut tower. So we're building in a lot of chassis strength. It's also a strong point in the car by design. So it's doing a good job to support the car and make a strong structure. Got it. Interesting. And then when we talked about load paths again, where the weight 
or pressure is coming if we do crash, right? Again, these are parts of the car that would absorb most, the goal is that's where that absorbs most of that pressure sure. from, from an impact, is that correct? Yes, we're trying to utilize inherently strong portions of the car to begin with because that's going to be our strongest support and our strongest foundation. Also, we need to consider multiple load paths. It's not always static or guaranteed that it gets loaded in one direction or another. So we try to create base plates that have multiple planes because it's going to be strong in, in shear depending on which load it gives. If you have multiple planes in a base plate, you get a lot more strength. Multiple planes. So multiple ways that that weight or pressure can come in will exactly. give it even more rigidity and strength. A single plane flat plate is never as strong as a multi-plane that has vertical, horizontal, hmm. or fore and aft because depending on which way that load comes from, you'll get much more strength in any one direction or another. Interesting, okay. That's again, something I didn't even realize. So one thing I see Ryan here is the, the bar going actually up through uh, the firewall, what most people say, and that's something that, this is an older car, and so is that something that was a safety component or performance component? Like what's happening with that bar there? In this early unibody, it's definitely primary is a structural rigidity it's gonna help hold the car together. These weren't known for being particularly rigid. Okay. So we're, we're tying into suspension components, making them stronger. It's gonna make the car perform better. But there's also a secondary aspect of preventing intrusion from suspension components in a crash. Nice. Keeping the wheels and the suspension from coming at the occupants if there's a forward collision. Okay, so like a more modern car has some of this already kind of built into the design. So maybe a less of a, a safety concern, more of a, just a performance of keeping the car together. and. Absolutely, that's something I'm considering when I'm discussing with a customer how we're going to build that roll cage. For example, this, this also has sill bars. Uh, the sills and rockers of these early unibodies were not so strong and intrusion from tree stumps and rocks were a factor. Now we've put in a strong uh, sill bar in place where if we were dealing with a more modern car, there's a tremendous amount of structure, even high strength steel in those areas already and we feel it's redundant to continue adding there. Got it. Interesting. Okay, let's move back to the front. All right, Ryan. So one thing I, I, I've always thought about too is this: these bars here that you have on the sides. One, are these a required component, and what are they doing? So in this case, this A pillar bar is required. The B pillar is not. Okay. They're protecting from downward force, a, a rollover, or sideways into a tree, or any other fixed object. They're creating crush resistance from the roof line down into the occupant. We have to have a big open space because they have to be able to get in and out of the car. So you have vulnerability and we're trying to minimize that vulnerability and add crush resistance from a, a downward hit here, coming through into our B pillar and hopefully down into the base plate. Also, this corner is especially vulnerable because it's a corner and it, we're creating a load path all the way down into the floor. So on this bar, the more angle, the safer it is, right? Sure. The more, but then the more you enclose this space. Absolutely. So it's another trade-off point. And there's restrictions in the FIA for how far we can go in each direction. Oh, interesting. Yes. Okay. And the FIA is, they just spend a lot of money in safety and design. So that's why we reference them a lot is they just have the budget to keep testing this over and over. And yes. we're in America here, we just, we rely on that data and information to make some of our decisions. And you know, 20, 30 years of experience of, sure. you've seen a lot of cars crash and you've seen the, the things that can happen to kind of make it safer. Um, one of the other things that we hadn't had a chance to talk about is the, the design of the roll cage over the occupants, right? There's a few options that you have, uh, but kind of this V-shaped design is the one to give you the most headroom. Is that accurate? In most cases it does. It's also the lightest and strongest uh, combination. Okay. So it's more popular these days. You still have, if viewed from above, you have an X shape passing through the oh. center of the car. So we're still making triangles, still making X's. We've just extended it through the entire length instead of in individual X's. So the other thing, Ryan, is why is this roll cage made out of metal? Like what, is there better materials that could be available or, and why, why is this built out of metal? Sure, we use steel in this case or one alloy of steel or another because it's generally very formable, it's easily worked, it bends, it, we're able to work it and build it into the shape we have. Inherently, it's not very strong in bending or shear, 
but it's very strong in compression and tension. That's why our design always goes into creating load paths so that this tubing is working in extension or compression and as little as possible in bending. So from what I hear you saying, really this piece of metal is not that strong by itself. It's all of these components that you've put together and the system as a whole is what creates the strength. It's, it's very strong in some aspects and not strong in others. Okay. It, and when we, if you had a side impact, you want this tube to act in tension. And it's very strong pulling, because that's what you'll do. You'll hit here and you'll pull at these base plates. Oh, it's very strong in pulling. It's not very strong in bending, which is why we can form it into the shapes we have in the car. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, and, and they have FIA and other people have tested other materials and other even different types of metal. And they have really found that this being probably this, this specific cage is what kind of metal? This is Doko R8, which okay. is a specific motorsport steel. And join us for the next video. We're going to actually talk about the different types of steel and metal that you guys can use for building a cage. But uh, this is one of the most popular ones that you use, right? Yeah. It's cage. rapidly growing uh, popularity across all motorsport. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks guys. Join us for the next series of videos here that we're going to do on, on actual different types of metal and some other stuff about actual roll cage safety and design. So we look forward for you to join us for that. Thank you.